Jerry Anderson's Space Precinct is the most ambitious science fiction series ever made for television. Bringing to life Jerry's vision of fighting crime in a strange and hostile environment on the other side of the galaxy demanded the talents of some of the world's most creative special effects artists to work alongside the series' powerful cast of actors, writers and directors. The result is a magnificent achievement, setting new standards in science fiction television. Using five stages at London's famous Pinewood and Shepperton Film Studios, over 300 people work for more than a year to bring Space Precinct to the screen. Action! For its creator, it seemed obvious that his new police series should be set in space. We've had every kind of cop imaginable, except the space cop. And so I thought, well, this is clearly a a very, very successful formula. If I can come up with something that is different and something that is in line with what I normally do, it could be very successful and so hence Space Precinct. Precinct 88 Station House sits in orbit, high above Demeter City on the planet Altor. New York cops Brogan and Haldane have transferred from Earth to work with the city's police force and soon discovered that crime in Demeter is much like crime in New York, only much worse. Brogan is played by Ted Shackelford, who for 14 years starred as Gary Ewing in Knott's Landing. People ask me what I wanted to do next and I'd say, well, I'd like to run around with a big gun and kill bad guys. Here I am. <laughs> Rob Youngblood plays Brogan's headstrong, womanizing partner, Officer Jack Haldane. I was thrilled about doing this because uh, I had kind of moaned and griped and yelled at my agents for a long time to get something like this. And uh, so this was right up my alley. Demeter City's role as a major interstellar trading center led to it becoming home to a remarkable collection of alien races. But Jerry was determined that each race kept its individual character. I felt that the aliens and the humans really should be much the same as people on Earth. On Earth you have different races, religions, colours, and some are good and some are bad, and we really have replicated that in Demeter City. A word to the wise. This place is infested with humans. The two main species we have are the Creons and the Tarns. The Creons are reptilian. Uh, they're based really on a chameleon type character. They have independent eye movement and they're quite tough. Then we have the Tarns. As we designed them, they became more aquatic and they have the power of telekinesis, which means they have a third eye and they have the power to read people's minds and move objects. Show off. The radio-controlled animatronic heads are tailor-made for the actors who wear them. And to make sure they fit exactly, the actor must first have a plaster cast taken of his own head. Actor and mime artist Rob Thurtle prepares to have his face covered in the same mold-making material used in dentistry. It's an organic base with um, seaweed. All right there, Rob. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. Okay, start soaking bandages. The face mold is held in place by a final layer of plaster of Paris. And now what you take a very deep breath and sort of expand your chest as if you're the Hulk. So you're forcing yourself to see a crack appearing, which is a nice way to release it. Beats the old hammer and chisel. Now this will just fall away. Now move your face, suck your cheeks in, bend your head slightly forward. Oops, just coming out of the jacket yeah, a bit. Yeah, yeah. So okay, that's it. Nice and slow. And there we have the life cast. Okay, do you want to hold that? Let's go on. <laughs> <laughs> the ordeal is over, and the 
plaster cast made from the mold will be used as the starting point for all the alien head designs to be worn by Rob throughout the series. Every new character in the series first emerges as a design drawing. Artist and sculptor Gary Pollard sketches Drover Pike, the high-powered attorney from The Forever Beetle. A clay sculpture of the head is built up on a glass fiber bust based on the original plaster cast, but which has been enlarged to make room for the electronics the head will contain. A series of molds taken from the clay sculpture result in the final latex skin, which is meticulously painted to suit the character. Eyes and facial expressions are powered by small motors controlled by a radio transmitter. A pair of spectacles completes the animatronic head of Drover Pike, and he's now ready to fight for his client. That's it. You want to go fishing? Do it on your own time, Brogan. You heard my client, Captain. Now hear me. This is the third time in a month that Brogan's badgered Mr. Wolf. He needs a new hobby, and you need to get your cops in line. Sound running. 117 take two. Cameras. And action! It's on the studio floor at Pinewood that the human and alien actors join the crew to get on with the serious business of filming the series. Working with aliens is kind of tricky because they're surrounded by six people with uh, radios that control various aspects of their face, you know, the eyebrows, eyes. There's always an army of people around them, far more than uh, someone like Elizabeth Taylor used to have, you know, who's <laughs> just in incredible the amount of attention they, they demand and, and uh, get. It doesn't have to be... Uh, the the, if it's the a light bit can start... If it's a bit oh. thrown away. Yeah, that's yeah. fine, because you come onto it as he's saying it. I yeah. thought it looked very natural. OK, fine. Thank you. Turn over, please. <laughs> 216, take two. Move! Move! It's your head! I said move! And just do one more, please, Chris. Yeah. Is that all that was about? Yeah. Rob Thurtle, playing alien businessman Armand Loyster, is beginning to feel the heat. Could I have a blast of oxygen yeah. in here? Yeah. 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 Just being inside that thing, you've been for about 10 or 15 minutes, it, it heats up very, very quickly. And uh, with the head on and all the electronics inside there, and just that amount of um, latex and foam rubber, you're going to get very hot anyway. But the amount of air you can actually get in is restricted. So that's that's even when you're static. <laughs> no, I'm all right, actually. It's fine. You got it? Then when you go in under studio lights and you start doing the sort of things that uh, um, Armand Loyster was asked to do, be in the back of a limousine and put his head out and flick a thing off the bonnet of the car with his tongue, you know, you, you really actually start gasping for breath. I can see very little uh, from inside because I'm looking out of the mouth. But added to that, it's talking, so it's closing. And so there are points when you see nothing. And if you're just trying to walk casually through your own flat where you're supposed to live and be very at ease and, uh, and your visibility keeps closing off, you basically, the way I work it is that before I put the head on, I just step it through so many times that my body has Sorry, a sort boys. of... Um, memory of the feeling of those steps and I know that there are six steps to the point I that I turn and I pretty much try and rehearse it with my eyes shut. Acting with, with somebody with a, with a blue head and three eyes is very strange. You know, first of all, you don't know where to look because, you know, you can't, their eyes, on the crayons especially, their eyes are so far wide apart, you can't just focus kind of in the middle. It's kind of one of these things. It, th that took a good couple of months to get used to and, and I know for the first two or three weeks, Ted and I both 
we'd get done with the scene with one of one of one of the heads, and we'd look at each other and say, "Where were you looking? What, what, what were you doing?" It's it's really weird, but you know, a, a credit though to all the actors and the technicians, and especially the actors inside of them, they make it so believable. You really do, after a yeah, while, forget that that's what you're doing. I needed that courier alive, remember? Uh, I didn't intend to kill him, Captain. I meant to disable him. You hit a vital organ. Well, how was I supposed to know his brain was in his armpit? Isn't it about time you learned? The actors playing aliens soon found that they had to learn new techniques if their characters were to prove convincing. I'd never done anything like this at all before. And we have in uh, our cast a number of people who've done a lot of mine, people like Rob Thurtle and so on, and they were immensely helpful in the first couple of months. They said, you know, if you do that, you look wooden. You know, don't just move like this. If you're going to move, you've got to move the same as if you're, it's, you know. Listen to me, you piece of sludge. I'm from Skull Street. That's right. It was my pond you messed in. If your face is fully expressive, which a mask never can be, however expressive you make it, the tiny little expressions indicate what you're doing. If you're trying to indicate something with a mask, I mean, if you want to listen, you've got to do something a little more than you would do if you're not wearing a mask. And I, I really hadn't thought about that sort of thing, and uh, it's developed, and I hope, you know, the heads are more alive now than they were when we started. Captain Podley's eyes are operated for Jerome by ex-Thunderbirds puppeteer Christine Glanville. He's an absolutely super actor, and that does make a difference, because uh, if you've got somebody that was really very wooden, it'd be much, uh, much more difficult to, uh, uh, to operate the, the eyes and things. But, but all our actors are so exceedingly good that uh, it's a pleasure. I trust Christine so much that I totally forget about what my eyes are doing. I mean, that's down to her. I mean, obviously, the voice and uh, whatever expression there is in the mouth, which, after all, is shaped around my own mouth, remains. But, no, I don't think about eyes at all. We agree what, what sort of expression we're going to do, and that's Christine's job. And she does it very well. Cross my heart. <laughs> Space Precinct boasts the most ambitious special effects ever to be used in television science fiction, and they're achieved by using state-of-the-art computer technology. Smoke! And some rather more traditional methods learned from earlier Jerry Anderson series. Action! Cut. Nice one. I rely very heavily on the, what I call the Thunderbird technique to fly a lot of the cruisers around on uh, wires and what have you and shooting at higher speeds to slow them down, give the explosions mass, all that kind of stuff. And I think it gives a, not necessarily a hyper-realistic, but a very entertaining sort of feel. Turn over. Action. Come on. Nice one. Detailed storyboards ensure that both the live action unit at Pinewood and Shepperton's model unit understand how a finished sequence is going to look and determine that the transition from special effect shots to live filming are undetectable. You can see here we've got a, a chase sequence, and the way that's drawn, it helps the live-action director visualise the shot, and also to, to see the right to left and left to right, so he can make sure that he's cutting live-action the correct way with uh, the model shots as well. So you get a nice flow through, so you can cut inside the vehicle, outside the vehicle, see what's going on, you don't break the continuity of the flow of the action that's happening. They're coming up! Get on their tails! Hang on! I can't see, sir! Next time I shoot back. Turn over. And action. I think that we have successfully captured 
a lot of the feel, a lot of the imagery that the cool. old Jerry Anderson shows. Whenever a, a craft crashes, very much in the Jerry Anderson tradition, it crashes as if it's loaded with thousands of tons of TNT. So it doesn't just blow up once, it blows up half a dozen times. I've never seen anything like this on television. I mean, the, the kind of uh, special effects they're doing and the animatronics and everything, this is really feature work. Um, this is stuff that you know Spielberg does and spends six months shooting what we spend 10 days shooting. So, I mean, it's, it's really incredible stuff. Such a tight schedule means that the space precinct model shop at Shepperton Studios is always at full stretch. Well, you've got to design, build, and Steve Begg has got to film within the 10 days everything that's required for that episode. So we have got to see how much time we can allot per model. We normally say three days to make a flying vehicle and five days to make a, a featured building. A single episode of Space Precinct may call for the shop to create as many as 25 finely detailed models to be used in well over 100 separate special effects shots. Gamma Dragon. We're at Optimum Logistics. Site R. Target is acquired. Clear. Well, the model shop doesn't only make models, as you see around me here. This is the interior of a stealth bomber. Uh, we've actually made this from real aircraft components, as well as everyday household goods, like uh, click bins, yeah. This is uh, a real ejector seat from a Buccaneer fighter. Prep and launch your missile. Please. And the throttles are not real throttles, but they are part of a helicopter. This is the seat uh, from one of the ejector seats. Up here, high altitude oxygen unit. And yes, you were wondering what happened to those mini click bins. Well, here they are as a door surround. Launch missile. Affirmative. Fire in the hole. So much of it is done in front of blue screens and green screens and miniatures and you know blah blah blah. And you got 15 people with remotes working heads, and and so it's it, there's not a lot of continuity to it as you're doing it. So it's uh, every week it's amazing to me to see the final product, and you know, and it's always kind of like, whoa, geez, that's what that looks like, you know, because you you have no idea. So it's it, it and, and so much of it I still marvel at going, how did they do that? You know, when I'm there doing it, and you still think, how did they do that? So it's really fantastic. The script of Hate Street called for Brogan and Haldane to scour an intergalactic freight depot in search of a suspect. How do you find a needle in a haystack? It would have been impossible to build such a vast and costly set, but a way was found by using the green screen process. See, I told you, nothing going to day night for 36 hours. Yeah, well, I don't care. She's here. I know she is. What'd you try down there? How do you find a needle in a haystack? The magic of green screen enabled our heroes to be reduced in size and combined with a model of the depot just a few feet high. See, I told you, nothing going to day night for 36 hours. Yeah, well, I don't care. She's here. I know she is. What'd you try down there? The combination of green screen and the computerized motion control camera creates some of the most breathtaking special effects in the series. The computer controls the movement of both the camera and model with extreme accuracy. 
What that enables us to do is to shoot the cruiser as you see it here, but then the computer that runs the camera and runs the motors here can go back to the start again and we can shoot another element. So it might be, say, the headlights, it may be the flashing lights on the top, it may be the navigation lights, the engines. Each of those are done as a separate, repeatable element. The many elements filmed by the motion control camera are combined using state-of-the-art computer software. The computer converts the image of the cruiser against the green screen into a solid black and white version of the image called a mat. The mat allows the cruiser to be inlaid into the chosen background. Other layers of filming, such as lights and engine glow, are added frame by frame to complete the effect. But even with powerful computers, such attention to detail takes time. This shot is 200 frames long. Uh, which is approximately eight seconds on-screen time, depending on the complexity of, of the elements that are combined. A shot like this could take anything from half a day up to two days to do. Missile released. The final task on each episode of the series is the creation of the soundtrack. Uh, there's a lot of uh, mixing of different elements music, background effects, as in atmospheres of cities, forests, wherever we are, spot effects, that's the sound of the ships, the machines, uh, guns, all that kind of thing, and also foley, which is the footsteps and rustles with shuffles of the actors. Because the show is set in the future, most of the sound effects must be specially created and, above all, must be believable. sound is right, um, you can see it, it straight away on the picture, that it fits the picture and makes it look real. Each green band represents a separate soundtrack, which has been matched to the picture and is now being mixed with the music score and the dialogue in Dolby Surround to add even more excitement. Oh, we should get a visual on Butler's place any second now. Dolby Surround gives a lot to the production, especially on, oh, on this kind of production, because it means that I can move the soundtrack not only left and right between the speakers, but also from front to back. So for shots where we have uh, spaceships coming towards us or going away, I can actually move the sound from the rear to the front or vice versa, which really gives you the impression that the ships are moving past you. Chucky! You have entered restricted, restricted military, military airspace. airspace. Change, Change your, your heading, heading to 096, 096 and exit, and exit this fly zone. zone. This is Officers Castle and Took, DCPD 88th Precinct, on official police business. Request permission to proceed. I repeat, I repeat change your heading and exit, and exit this fly zone. zone. Failure, Failure to do so, so will result in the immediate use of force. As a filmmaker, I dream up situations. Um, I have mental pictures. And I come into the studio and I do my best to bring those pictures and those concepts to the screen. Um, and I suppose really I'm producing what I like myself. And if people feel that that is a particular style and they like it, then I guess I'm pretty lucky.
one would say, lovely. <laughs>